Kia good morning everybody. It's good to see you. Um, Michaela and Caleb and myself and another colleague uh, just spent a couple of weeks overseas. We went to Willow Creek Community Church where there was 135 leaders from around the world doing a leadership intensive there. And uh, I've got to say it was just an outstanding time of learning for us. Very uh, challenging as well as very affirming. So just a really good balance for us as leaders to be able to test what it is that we're doing here and learn from those who have uh, I've got some more experience under their belt, so a very good time. Well, um, tonight, today, I'm on jet lag time, um, uh, we're going to be looking at the final talk from the series that we've been doing on King David's life. It's been a fantastic series, I don't know about you guys, but I've really enjoyed preparing it, whether you've had to suffer listening, it's a different story, but um, the stories that have been so, uh, so transparent, haven't they? where we just read about David's problems, his challenges, and today's no different. Today we're going to find this final story that we focus on, talking about David as he gets older. But as he gets older, like a lot of people who get older, uh, he fell into the grip of fear, and the grip of fear. Now there's all sorts of fears around, aren't there? Many years ago, I was down in Fiordland with some friends of mine going on a hunting trip, and we pulled into... Milford Sound, where we were to catch this fixed-wing plane and fly up the coast. When we arrived, the weather was terrible. Winds, sleet, all the best that uh, Fjordland can throw at you. And we talked to the pilot, and we said, oh, you know, we're really keen to get in. What do you think? And these mountain pilots are a breed of themselves, unto themselves. And he goes, oh, yeah, we'll we'll be all right. So we packed all this gear into this uh, Cessna plane, shoved ourselves in there, squeezed in amongst the gear. I was sitting in the front next to the pilot. A couple of other guys were in the back with all the gear crowded around them. And we took off down the runway and uh, just slowly started to climb. And as we got higher and higher, we became more and more buffeted. And I looked down on the water, maybe five or 600 metres ahead of us, and I could see this a little whirlwind going on the water, sweeping up all the water. I thought, oh, that's different, that's interesting. Well, we flew right into it. It was a low-pressure zone, and the plane just went... <laughs> right down, dropped over a thousand feet in probably less than six or seven seconds. And of course, everything in the plane went everywhere, including the guys at the back who'd failed to strap themselves in. So they were pinned to the roof with it, whacking their heads, and there was gear everywhere, and the alarms on the plane were going, dirt, 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 dirt. and I was staring at the pilot, and he was pulling this and doing this, and, and, uh, and then we came out of it, and we're like, no one said anything, you know? Because <laughs> we're cool, we're cool. We came out the fjord, and I turned right up the coast, and about 20 minutes later we landed, and uh, I turned to the pilot after we landed on this grass strip, and I said, oh, that was a bit of a rough ride, wasn't it? And he goes, just another day in the office, mate. (laughs) I thought, yeah, they're a breed unto themselves, these guys, you know, they really, really are. And uh, yeah, so that was being gripped by fear, but fear comes in all sorts of different forms, doesn't it? And what I want to talk about today is about a fear that David had. And it's a fear that accompanied him as he got older. Now the definition of someone who's getting older is a person who looks in the mirror and goes, what the heck happened? (laughs) Yeah, I can see some of you older folks looking at me going, yeah, yeah, that's right. What the, what the heck's gone wrong? <laughs> you know, I still feel like I'm 19, but it certainly doesn't look that way. Well, for David, he's, um, he's at this stage of life too. He's in this transition point where he's coming into old age. And when you enter into old age, you know, uh, middle age and then start entering into more senior years, uh, life starts to be measured in different ways. It's like waking up in the morning. It's like, oh, I'm still here. That's good. That's a good start to the day, you know, and, uh, and you hear about friends who aren't doing so well with their health, and, and things start to change in your life. You know, when you're 21, you went to 21sts, and when you're 25, you go to weddings, and, and then when you're 50, you're going to see people who are unwell, and then your 70s and 80s, you're starting to say goodbye to friends and family, and that's the transition of life. That's the journey of life. Well, for David, um, he was at this stage in his life. And um, what we're going to find is that David started to anticipate the worst. And there's a real giveaway in this whole story that reveals this. David started to anticipate negative things happening. And fear is faith 
to expect the worst. You know that fear is a form of faith. It's when you say, oh, I don't think that'll happen. I think it'll be worse than that. Oh, I don't think it'll be good. It'll be bad. Oh, and a lot of Christians actually drink at the well of fear. They really do. And, and you can find biblical reasons for this. You know, end times, the Antichrist. In fact, I was in Chicago. I walked past one of his big towers that he built <laughs> last week. That's the latest. Just jump on the net. Eight years ago, it was another guy called Obama. And eight years before that, and you know how it goes. A Christian's can be really vulnerable to drinking from the well of fear. Okay, not saying that we shouldn't be biblical and uh, be mindful of the times that we're in, but we just got to be really careful. We don't sort of bind ourselves up with fear and we live out of fear rather than faith. Faith is not that everything is going to be good, but faith is that everything is under God's control. Faith is that even though I might be going through a difficult time, God has a bigger purpose and a bigger plan for that. And that's being outworked in his kingdom plan and building me up as a Christian in whatever context of suffering or trial or challenge that I might be facing. And it's the ability to go, okay, God, this is tough, but we're in it together. That's faith in action. Fear is, okay, God, this is tough. And that's all you think. This is tough, and this is where it stays. So for David, um, he was at a place in his life now where fear was starting to take control of his life. And I want to explain how this happened. Because fear for David was fear that there would be uh, no finances, and that can be the same for us, no family, no health, and no future. These are the big four that we're often challenged with, aren't they? There'll be subtle differences and variations on all of those. But for each one of us, we can be fearful of what it is the future might hold. And we see a lot of fear out in our society. You know, you, you're told that, you know, you need to get your finances sorted because you don't know how much the future is going to cost. And that's the truth. We don't know how much the future is going to cost. The perfect plan is to know exactly when you're going to die and spend your last dollar 10 minutes before then. That'll really upset the kids. <laughs> eh? But you never know that, do you? But fear can rule ourselves. You know, Parents these days can be accused rightfully so in some cases of being helicopter parents. <clears throat> you know, the parents that hover over their kids. Well, yeah. oh, oh, little Johnny, be careful on that slide. You know, you might fall off. And, uh, you know, you might hurt yourself. Or you march down to the school teacher's uh, office because little Johnny got, had someone poke their tongue out at him and <laughs> it's really offended him and he doesn't deserve that, he deserves better. You know, we can be helicopter parents. We can be so obsessed with our businesses that we forget about what it is we're working for. And we can become so preoccupied with success that we fail to be successful at the things that are important. But for David, the story that we're going to look at started like this. It's an unusual start, but you see the spiritual dynamics that start being associated with, uh, with a Christian life here. First Chronicles 21.1 says, Satan rose up against Israel and incited David to take a census of Israel. You notice here, it's a, it's a fascinating little, little, little text here because what's going on is that um, the devil's wanting to get at Israel. So how does the devil get at Israel? He gets the leader to do something wrong. You can't necessarily target a whole nation, but if you can target one and find that point of vulnerability that they're open to, uh, you can start to do something here that would uh, have an implication that we're going to look at, which is going to cause uh, an enormous result. And so for David, uh, he was being challenged now at his point of fear. Why? Well, David had a whole lot of things happen in his life that had given him a story, a backstory, like all of you, all of you have a backstory of all the things that have happened in your life and if you were to write down the things that caused you pain, that is your backstory that can cause negative faith. We call it fear, negative faith to develop. Okay? And so what's happening now is David is going to have this fear tapped into. And what did David fear the most? Well, he feared that his family wouldn't maintain the dynasty that had been given to him through the Lord. 
There was a fear. He wanted his family to do well. And we can all identify with this. We can all understand this. But we're going to look at that a little bit more in the future, in the, in the future of this talk. And we're going to see how it is uh, that that can become so obsessive to us that it causes us to stumble. David, of course, was worried about the neighboring enemies, the Amalekites, the Moabites, the Philistines. And Israel was at peace at this time, but he might be lying in bed going, I wonder if Goliath has nephews. Big, muscly nephews. Okay? I think I might have seen Goliath's sister once. She was not pretty. Yeah, he's got big nephews. And they're going to take on my kids. And those nephews are going to have kids, and they're going to take on my grandchildren. Can you see how you can start to convince yourself? You know, that the problems you face are going to be future problems for other people in your family. And these neighbors, these enemies, these Philistines and Moabites and Amalekites and the like, they are the people whom David had fought and seen his friends die under their sword. And so he experienced this pain, the pain of leadership. And of course, the biggest pain that he suffered the most was the civil war when his son Absalom had decided that he needed to be the king. And he pulled an army to himself, people who were once loyal to David. And he turned them against David, caused them to fight for him. And there was a civil war, a clash. So here are all these points of pain in David's life. And that is what made him vulnerable. Now he was in a place where he was trying to test and measure as to whether he would be threatened in the future in these ways again. And even more so now that he's getting old... He was wondering about his legacy, about the future of his children and his grandchildren. Are they going to be vulnerable to the things that hurt and affected me and nearly caused me to lose the throne? These are all normal things, aren't they? There are generations of people who have lived through difficult experiences and have had the results of those permanently fixed in their life. Uh, some, some friends of ours... Um, David and Linda Cowie are missionaries in the life of this church here. Um, we stayed, uh, my, my family and I had a sabbatical down at Lake Tekapo around about 14 or 15 years ago. And we stayed in David's mum's house. She had just passed away. And she was at Tekapo, and she had this shed. And it was like a treasure trove. It was filled with all this amazing st- old stuff. And I said to David, I said, Why did your mum, 20 years a widow, why did she accumulate all this old stuff? And he says, well, she was a child of the Depression. In the Depression, you didn't throw anything away, did you? They were short of everything. Yeah? In fact, I I was at a Bible camp many years ago, and I um, was talking to this group of people, and we had to share our names and what they meant. And this lady who was born in the 1930s in the Depression, she goes, told us her name. And then we said, oh, what's your second name? That was what we had to do. And she said, oh, I haven't got a second name. I was born in the Depression. We were short of everything. (laughs) (laughs) That was quite (laughs) That's good. But fear causes you to have these reactions or responses, Yeah. And so for David, he didn't want his family to suffer in the way that he had suffered. So when he was prompted by the devil, by Satan, to go and take a census, this tapped right into his fear. And so the question we've got to ask ourselves is, what makes you fearful? Yeah? The fear of, the fear of missing out? The fear of uh, taking, um, fear of missing out an opportunity? They call it FOMO, don't they? Fear of missing out. Yeah, that's a real fear in today's society. You know, your bucket list has got to be fulfilled and completed, or you've got FOMO, fear of missing out. Others are doing better than you. But, but what you fear makes you vulnerable. And uh, in Job, we find that Job says these words What I feared has come upon me. Okay, Job lost his whole family, they were wiped out. What I dreaded has happened to me. Any parent would say this. They lost their family. And he says, I have no peace, no quietness. I have no rest, but only turmoil. Okay, and this is what 
fear does. Fear makes you vulnerable. When you're vulnerable, you're exposed to things that can take away your peace and your quietness and your rest, and you're left with only turmoil. But the question that we've got to ask ourselves, if we were to put ourselves in David's shoes, is this. Um, what do you think about as you get older? What do you think about as you get older? Okay. I, I know for myself, I, you know, I'm, I'm, actually I turn 53 tomorrow. Um, and so, <clears throat> yeah, somebody's already told me they've told Radio Rima, so um, <laughs> thanks Brian and Colleen, I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, anyway. <laughs> but, um, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> excuse me, um, but getting older is a sort of form of gradualism, isn't it? When you get older, you slowly, gradually get older. And um, <clears throat> it, it sort of adds up. And the things that you used to do, you don't do. And uh, thinking about going hunting, as I mentioned earlier on, about going to Fjordland, um, I've decided in my mind that there are certain hills where deer don't live anymore. Uh, years of experience have told me this. But funnily enough, my son found some the other day. Yeah, a while ago I was out shooting with Taylor and, um, and he was ahead of me, strangely. And um, this deer jumped up off this grassy knoll, sprinted across this, this little clearing and, uh, and, he, and he shot it. I was like, man, that's clever. That was very good. Very good shooting. I was very impressed. Um, Got it, killed it instantly, which is what you want. I said, man, I'm so impressed. You know what I'm going to let you do? I'm going to let you carry it out by yourself. <laughs> Loving father, wouldn't want to rob him of the experience, would I? See, gradually getting wiser, okay? But the thing is that as you get older, you, you want the best for your family. You want the, the best for those who you're responsible for. But there's this checklist of pain that you go through and you say, but I... I don't want my kids to experience this. I don't want my family to go through this. I don't want them to have this experience and endure the, the struggle or the suffering that I might have endured. And so when David is now being asked, uh, in a sense, what is it that you fear the most? David's response is this. I'm going to take a census. Because I don't want my nation turning against my kids. I don't want my people being exposed to the enemy in the way that I was. I don't want them to fight the fights that I had to fight. I don't want them to see the bloodshed that I had to experience. Because remember, David is the king whom God said is not allowed to build him a temple. Why? Because he's got too much blood on his hands because of the battles that he's fought. And so let's have a look at the scripture. It says here, Satan rose up against Israel and incited David to take a census of Israel. So David said to Joab, who's the commander of his armies, and the, it says he's the commander of his troops, go and count the Israelites from Beersheba to Dan. Then report back to me so that I may know how many there are. But Joab replied, may the Lord multiply his troops a hundred times over. My Lord the king, are they not all my Lord's subjects? Why does my Lord want to do this? Why should he bring guilt on Israel? Here's Joab being a godly man and challenging his leader. His leader wants to count the troops, but Joab has this well of experience that he's drawn from by fighting alongside David in many battles over decades. And you can almost see the catch cry of the Israeli army there, when Joab says these words, see there in the second last line, may the Lord multiply his troops a hundred times over. You can guarantee that those words were the battle cry of the Israelites as they took their troops into fighting the enemy who may have had superior numbers. May the Lord multiply the troops a hundred times over. You can see them encouraging each other as they go into battle, wielding their swords. We're fighting for the Lord. We're doing this because God has called us. We're going to win this battle. May the Lord multiply our troops a hundred times over. That's what it meant to be a man of faith going into a battle when God was on your side. It wasn't about the numbers. It was about being in God's will. And the Lord will multiply our troops. 
What a great leader's expression that would have been. And then Joab immediately says, My lord the king, are they not all my lord's subjects? In other words, hold on, David. I know there's been a season, I know there's been a time when your son Absalom drew part of the military might of Israel to himself to fight against us. But look, all the subjects of Israel are now subject to you. You don't have to be fearful anymore. Those days are gone. Those times have passed. And then finally he says, why should he bring guilt on Israel? And what Joab is referring to here is a passage that was brought to us by Moses in the early days of Israel's formation. It says here in Exodus 30, 11 and 12, And the Lord said to Moses, When you take a census of the Israelites to count them, each one must pay the Lord a ransom for his life at the time he is counted. Then no plague will come on them when you number them. It's a strange little verse, isn't it? But for the people of Israel, this would have been a sign from the Lord that you're not to be counting your troops. If you do, you're going to pay for this. You've got to pay physically, and it's a sign to you that unless you are counted for in this way, there will be a plague brought upon you. So it's, a, in a sense, God saying to the, the leaders, you don't count the people. You trust in me. Otherwise, plagues are going to come. Okay? So for Joab, he knew this. David should have known this. And the people of Israel had never been counted in this fashion before. So the scripture says, the king's word, however, overruled Joab. So Joab left and went throughout Israel and then came back to Jerusalem. Joab reported the number of the fighting men to David. Now listen to this. In all Israel, there were 1,100,000 men who could handle a sword, including 470,000 in Judah. But Joab did not include Levi and Benjamin in the numbering because the king's command was repulsive to him. This command was also evil in the sight of the Lord, so he punished Israel. So what Joab's trying to do here is he's trying to obey the orders of his boss, but at the same time he's trying to not get Israel offside with God. He's saying, well, I counted them, but I counted them wrong. Does that count? If I counted them wrong, am I really counting them at all? If I chose not to count those people, does that really make the count worthwhile? Because he knew that Israel would be punished. And this is where the issue is of leadership. David had fear. Joab had faith. And all of a sudden, this story takes a twist. Because there are times in all of our lives when we wake up, don't we? And we go, oh my goodness. What have I done? What am I doing? I shouldn't have done that. What? Oh, man. I should have listened to my friends. They were counseling me and I was just so bullheaded, so pigheaded that I wasn't going to take their advice. And here we find immediately that David says this. Then David said to God, I've sinned greatly by doing this. Now I beg you, take away the guilt of your servant. I have done a very foolish thing. And, and here's the, the challenge that we are faced with. As we get older, we look at this list of hurt that may have accumulated in our own lives. We look at the experiences that we've had and we say, I don't want to set up a legacy for my family that will cause them to suffer in the way that I suffered. In David's case, he took a census to convince himself that he wasn't going to leave this, this world with his family set up with a civil war just around the corner. And so he goes and he counts. But for each one of us, we have to be so careful how we set up what it is that we're doing for our families. You see, it's very easy for us to say, I'm going to control the outcomes for my family. In a sense, I'm going to lead from the grave. But God is saying to each one of us, as he's saying to David, look, the God of Israel will be the God of the next king and the next king and the next king. And he'll say to us as well that the God who has led you is going to lead your children and your children's children. And they're going to go through challenges. They're going to go through trials. 
They're going to go through difficulties. They're going to go through pain. But God will be with them. They will learn their lessons. They'll learn their lessons, some of them the hard way, the difficult way. I was talking to a pastor uh, earlier in the year, who's well past retirement age, Baptist pastor. And um, he said, you know what, we've tried to get pastors in here to replace me, but we can't find the right people. It's really difficult. So he wrote this into me, to an email to me, and I wrote back and I said, you know what, I think there just comes a time when you've got to leave and hand it over to a, a call committee. I said, the reason why is that 30 years ago, a call committee in your church prayed fervently and they got it right. Do you think the same God could speak to another core committee in your church and get it right? He didn't reply. <laughs> Such is le leadership loneliness. <laughs> but here's the challenge. When you're in this point of command, the biggest lesson a leader learns is that others pay for your mistakes. And for David, this is a strange scenario because it wasn't a mistake done out of anger or bitterness. It was a mistake done out of fear and a sense of benevolence that he simply wanted the best for those who were following him. He wanted the best for his kids. He didn't want the kids to have blood on their hands. He didn't want to see civil war. And you could list a whole lot of experiences that you have had. And maybe it's the father who was raised in a certain period of time. He didn't have much money. You know? I don't want my kids to ever experience that poverty. And so what they do is they work so hard that the kids never experience a father. So this is how the story goes. The Lord then said to Gad, who is David's seer, prophet, he says, go and tell David, this is what the Lord says. I'm giving you three options. Choose one of them for me to carry out against you. Okay, this is a little bit like being at school. I don't know if you ever had that. Do a thousand lines. Stay in at lunchtime for the rest of the week. We'll get four of the best. <laughs> I always went for four of the best. I had to go and play rugby at lunchtime. That was way more important, even if I walked funny for a little bit. Um, yeah, punishment was swift and severe, but it was over. Well, David sort of takes the same attitude as we see. So Gad, so Gad went to David and said to him, this is what the Lord says. Take your choice. Three years of famine, three months of being swept away before your enemies with their swords overtaking you, or three days of the sword of the Lord, days of plague in the land, with the angel of the Lord ravaging every part of Israel. Now then, decide how I should answer the one who sent me. That's a bit tough, isn't it? Okay, what's this God of mercy all about? Okay. Well, the simple truth is that God is a God of his own principles. God has kingdom ways, and he doesn't violate his own principles. Uh, 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 otherwise, he'd be double-minded. Okay? And in this situation, he'd set boundaries in place concerning the counting of the troops. David violated that. Joab knew that, so it wasn't an unknown violation. David knew that he'd violated this principle of God. And, and, and David, <clears throat> David makes this... A quite amazing response to the prophet when he says this. David said to Gad, I am in deep distress. Okay, you can understand that. Let me fall into the hands of the Lord, for his mercy is very great, but do not let me fall into human hands. Now, I think that's a beautiful picture of David's repentance, isn't it? It's like, I know I've blown it. Three years of famine, I'm really falling into the hands of the people. Three months of fighting the enemy, I'm falling again in the hands of the people. But three days of the sword of the Lord against Israel, well, I think I can plead for mercy from the God who loves me. And so the story unfolds. So the Lord sent a plague on Israel, and 70,000 men of Israel fell dead. And God sent an angel to destroy Jerusalem. But as the angel was doing so, the Lord saw, saw it and relented. See, there's the grace concerning the disaster and said to the angel who was destroying the people enough withdraw your hand 
The angel of the Lord was then standing at the threshing floor of Arona the Jebusite. David looked up and saw the angel of the Lord standing between heaven and earth, with a drawn sword in his hand extending over Jerusalem. Then David and the elders, clothed in sackcloth, fell face down. David said to Gad, Was it not I who ordered the fighting men to be counted? I, the shepherd, have sinned and done wrong. These are but sheep. What have they done? Lord my God, let your hand fall on me and my family, but do not let this plague remain on your people. Then the angel of the Lord ordered Gad to tell David to go up and build an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Arona the Jebusite. So David went up in obedience to the word that Gad had spoken in the name of the Lord. David said to him, Let me have the sight of your threshing floor so I can build an altar to the Lord that the plague on the people may be stopped. Sell it to me at full price. Arona said to David, Take it. Let my lord the king do whatever pleases him. Look, I will give the oxen for the burnt offerings, the threshing sledges for the wood, and the wheat for the grain offering. I'll give it all. I'll give all this. But King David replied to Arona, No, I insist on paying the full price. I will not take for the Lord what is yours or sacrifice a burnt offering that costs me nothing. So David paid Arona 600 shekels of gold for the site. David built an altar to the Lord there and sacrificed burnt offerings and fellowship offerings. He called on the Lord and the Lord answered him with fire from heaven on the altar of burnt offering. Then the Lord spoke to the angel and he put his sword back in its sheath at that time when David saw that the Lord had answered him on the threshing floor of Arona, the Jebusite, he offered sacrifices there. For David, as this story concludes, we see that what God was doing to preserve David and to restore David was to build into David's understanding the right picture of the right size of God. And that's actually what we lose sight of when we're trying to control, if you like, the legacy of the next generation or the experience of the next generation. As we are running out of our understanding of the sovereignty of God, that is drying up. And so even in the punishment that God brought upon David, the sword of the Lord fell upon Israel. David had to stand back and say, God is a powerful God whom is to be feared. And you notice even in the making of the sacrifice here, there's a subtle little word that is again a giveaway to the power of God. Uh, see there in the uh, middle of the second line. He called on the Lord and the Lord answered him with fire from heaven on the altar of burnt offering. Okay, just a little throwaway line. Fire came down from heaven and began the fire that was to bring about the sacrifice of the burnt offering. Again, David is blown away, overwhelmed by the bigness of God. And this is what comes, this is what brings us to the summary. When fear is right sized, it leads to worship. Or maybe when our worship is right sized, it diminishes our fear. It was fear that caused David to count the soldiers. It was fear that caused God to come in and put himself back into the picture in a way that allowed David to see once again how big God was. And so we're called to draw from the well of faith, not draw from the well of fear. We're called to draw from the well of faith that allows us to see God for whom he is. Because if we draw from the well of fear, our size, or our view of the size of God, God never changes size, but our, our view of him does, we become overwhelmed with a sense that God has done something once for me in this generation, but he won't do it for the next generation. And so we try to control the outcomes, and our hand comes out from the grave to try to control our children, or our children's children, with things that, we were fearful of 
in our own lives that we don't want to affect the next generation. It's a big challenge for us. It's always been a big challenge for every generation that God in his majesty, in his omniscient manner, will always be the big God who will be there for every generation beyond us. Let's stand and pray. Father, we are thankful for this word that comes to us in a way that hits us where we are today. The fear of David is in all of us because we're the people who like to calculate and count. We're the people who like to add up and measure. We're the people who like to project forward and then at times that can cause us great fear. We're the people of thousands of experiences, both positive and painful. And for this reason, Lord, we try to create a future for those we love that will see them never suffer in maybe the ways we've done. But in doing so, Lord, we write you out of the picture and we put ourselves in the place of God. We say, I will protect. When you say you will protect, we say, I will provide. When you say you will provide, we will say we will give safety. When you give safety, we say we provide a future and a hope. When you are the future and the hope. So God, help us right-size you. Help us put things into a biblical and God-given perspective. Or we diminish you down to the God of one generation and not the next. So we pray, Lord. We pray, Lord, you just continue to build our understanding of you and to trust you deeply, even as time runs short for us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.